I am State Representative Yvonne Lewis Holly. I am a native of Raleigh, uh, a graduate of uh, Enlow High School and Howard University. I was raised in Raleigh uh, in a community of local civil rights leaders. And I was amongst the first wave of students that integrated the school system here uh, back in 19th. <laughs> you didn't get that, but, but you know. <laughs> that we was understand. pretty funny. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, a, as a result of how I was raised and, and my experiences in integrating the schools, being the first black cheerleader, but Dami White. Uh, school in the state. I learned how to work with difficult people dif during difficult times, different kinds of people, I mean, uh, during difficult times where we were all in the process of trying to uh, make major changes in society. Uh, I have uh, been active in North Carolina when I moved back in 85. <laughs> Excuse me. I was a state employee where I was in purchasing contracts where I bought basically scientific medical and uh, equipment for 25 years, as well as anything that didn't know what it was and, and did a number of service contracts as well. And uh, I have spent the last eight years in the North Carolina General Assembly representing District 38 and in, in the House. While there, uh, I've been a champion for things like food deserts because just as I went in, now mind you, my area of expertise was economic development and business and then when I go into the state house, my community says, oh, but we need food, we need housing, we need something more basic. So I've been a champion for those issues in the North Carolina General Assembly. I was able to get money uh, in the bill, in the budget for a food desert bill called Corner Store Initiative, which put nutrient-rich foods in corner stores uh, in North Carolina. Yes, it was underfunded. But what has happened is, is that the stores that are currently being, that have been open and used are, are the ones that were in the hurricane areas that got hit where they lost big grocery stores. And so I take a little pride in knowing that nutrient rich food is accessible in some of our communities, though not all of them just yet. Uh, my most recent endeavor in the General Assembly has been in the area of housing. I started a multi-chamber bipartisan uh, committee to look at uh, housing and housing affordability uh, uh, in North Carolina, because that too is an area that my na my neighborhood in particular and uh, in Raleigh is being gentrified very quickly. And my, I see the changes that are coming and my community is saying, I can't even afford to live. Uh, right now in Wake County, we have 3000 school age children living in hotels. These are working parents, working moms, working dads who cannot afford housing to live in Raleigh. And uh, the COVID uh, pandemic has really exasperated a lot of that. Uh, I ran on a platform called um, My Ally Program, Affordable Living Initiative, because, you know, you could put somebody in a house, but if they have nothing to eat, you know, you still, it's still a big problem. And they're making choices between, do I pay my rent? Do I buy my medication? Do I do certain things? So Ally is trying to bring together the whole community across North Carolina urban and rural, businesses, private, uh, uh, for nonprofits and governmental entities, and just John Q citizens across North Carolina. And let's sit down and talk about these issues. What can we do? What can we use as low hanging fruit? And what would need some legislation so that we can possibly uh, bring that to the forefront? It was enhanced more by COVID. Ally includes affordable housing, affordable health care, and food security. Uh, it includes workforce development, wages and jobs, in particular, uh, job training and wages and workforce development. And the last piece is transportation, because if you can't get to work, you can't work. So uh, it is a comprehensive kind of look at what North Carolina has, what can we do, and how we can take it. And that's the platform that I've been running on uh, since the election. So lieutenant governors, along with their official duties, often kind of find a, a, a policy focus area in which they can uh, assist the governor with his or her agenda. Um, is that an approach you would like to take as well? You mentioned housing and, and food security and workforce. Um, is, so is that an approach you would take and are those the topic areas that you would choose to focus on? 
Uh, yes, and let me say this. I am all for education. I'm, I'm a public education girl, and I've been fighting for the last eight years in the General Assembly for Medicaid expansion and public education. So those are a given, you know, and I will continue to fight for those diligently, you know. Uh, but the ally program is something that I would like to focus on because I, we, there is no housing department here in North Carolina. There is no uh, uh, one place that you can go uh, in, within the state governmental entity that addresses the needs of both the rural and the urban communities. They're both different. And I found being in the General Assembly that as you do legislation for one, you could be hurting another. So you need to have a complete understanding of what's out there. So that if I put in, if we do a law for something that's uh, or, or um, applicable to the urban area, it does not hurt the people in the rural area. So it's a comprehensive look. We need to go back and, and do that. Look for low hanging fruit, see what kind of legislation can come out of that and what may be able to be done on the executive level. You know, the Lieutenant Governor serves in the executive branch and uh, uh, in the General Assembly. So I, I see that role as a liaison between the two and, and uh, trying to be bringing people together. Your opponent says that systemic racism is a kind of liberal concoction, that it's, that it's not real. I want you to respond to that. Well, we know, we know better than that. And uh, I'm very disappointed in, in some of the things that he has said. He denies that it exists. He denies that, that there's any police brutality. He denies that uh, of climate change. And when, you, when you're in such a state of denial means that if you don't see that it exists, you're not willing to sit down with the people who have the problem in order to fix it. Uh, my concern about systemic racism is, is that the nation and the world is looking for America to solve the problems of systemic racism. That's why we have uh, demonstrations in other countries about what's happening in America now because they would like for us to show leadership in this area. And when you have someone who completely denies that it exists, then they're not willing to sit at a table with anybody to talk about how to fix it. And uh, I, I, it is de definitely exists. And you know, you've, you've dealt as a, as a lawmaker with issues of inequity. How do you, how do you address that as a member of, of the executive branch? Well, you know, I go back to my high school days. <laughs> you know, uh, one of the things about high school, you all know that the cliques and different groups that, that, that think differently than you, but you, you treat people one-on-one. -on -one. I respect you for who you are and you have a right to your opinion, but let's sit down and talk and see where we are from the beginning. Where we are, what do we have in common, and we work from there. Uh, that's how I was able to get the food um, security, uh, food security introduced in the General Assembly. You know, I did everything I could to not make it a Republican or a Democratic thing, because when you're hungry, you don't ask, are you Republican or Democrat? You just want to know who, who can feed me, who can help me out. So uh, I, can, I see myself as that bridge builder and that you do it by talking to people, you see people for who and what they are, and, and you try to work together with them to build um, coalitions to try to get things to happen. So uh, uh, one of the roles of Lieutenant Governor is you're kind of the tie-breaking vote in the state Senate. What's the most important piece of legislation that's going to come in front of the Senate in the next couple of years? Well, you know, I, I'd, I'd like to say my first vote would be for Medicaid expansion, Medicaid expansion, Medicaid expansion. Too many people are hurting. That is money that we've already spent. Uh, the 10% the that the state would have had to put in our hospitals in North Carolina has, have agreed to absorb. So that it is really no cost to us. So there's no reason for us not to have Medicaid expansion. It's been proven to work in, mo many, uh, in most of the states that it's in. It is, uh, and it's desperately needed. You know, we, we, here we are in the middle of a pandemic and people lost their jobs and their insurances. You know, uh, so, so there is no safety net and we need to do what we can. And I saw something the other day where the average cost of someone who's had COVID that if they have to get hospitalized, not being on a ventilator for a long time, it was running $20,000. You know, uh, I don't have $20,000 in my bank account that I can cover if I lost my job and lost my insurance. So these are things that we need to look at. And Medicaid expansion is a safety net for a number of people. Uh, 650,000 North Carolinians will have access to health care. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, I also love the Affordable Care Act, 
and, and some of the things it does, I think it needs to be strengthened. I think that those people who want to continue with private medical insurance, there still needs to be a strong uh, pathway there. I think we can do all of it to, to make sure that North Carolinians are covered. Ned, do you have questions? Mr. Representative, your opponent is a uh, big advocate for uh, gun rights. And uh, I know that you mentioned one of your issues is some, some controls on guns, but Democrats have been sort of shy to really get into this issue because it is so divisive. But what can we do about gun violence in, in the state? Uh, any ideas there? Yeah, well, there's a number of things that we can do. Uh, you know, first of all, we can make sure that there are laws that uh, guns are kept in safe places. You know, this is, you know, I think recently in North Carolina, we had a young man who found his father's gun and, and he accidentally shot himself. You know, I mean, we need, to, we need to make sure that guns are kept in a safe place. Of course, every, they all need to be registered. And we need to close some of the loopholes of buying guns in what a gun shows, you know. Now, I'm not sure a gun, gun person, you know, uh, it's not a big issue that I have, but I do believe also that in uh, some of the sensible gun, what do you call it, the, the red flag laws, okay, where uh, right now, if someone's having a mental health crisis, you know, uh, and they are in a, in a real fragile state of mental health crisis and the family or friends or someone brings it to the court system and the judge can decide to temporarily take the, we the, the, the weapon away until the, the particular crisis has passed. I think that that is just what we really need to do because access to a weapon that they may harm themselves or someone else uh, is just not needed. It is not a permanent taking of guns away. I don't see as, as good gun laws being exclusive from uh, the Second Amendment. I, I, I believe in your right to protect yourself. I'm just trying to also protect uh, the other people in North Carolina in case someone has a, a crisis or they've been known to threaten or to abuse someone. You know, one of the effects of the pandemic on the courts has been that they've had to sort of throw out a lot of minor cases. Uh, they've dropped bail requirements for a lot of people. They've let people out of jail that really weren't dangerous offenders, just couldn't afford bail. Some of these things are good things. Do you think that this is a, a change that could take hold and become permanent in the, in the, in the court system with less of these minor cases and less bail requirements, that kind of thing? Well, I think we've done a level of over-policing to begin with, and I, and I believe in the Second Chance Amendment. Uh, I, I've worked with uh, a lot of people in trying to help them re-enter back into our, into our system with jobs and housing. Uh, I believe that there's a lot of people who, pay, who are paying lifelong sentences for smaller crimes. You know, they do things like lose their driver's license behind something that had nothing to do with driving because they couldn't pay a fine or fee. So they lost their ability to drive and get to work to pay the fine or fee. Uh, you know, we're punishing people with things that are just an over punishment. You aren't able to get a housing because you have a record. You aren't able to get a job because you've had a record. Now, some of these crimes, I'm not talking about your serious crimes, but in many instances, a lot of these crimes are something that people have already paid the time for and they need to be re-entered back in society. And uh, we need to put some money in the re-entry effort so that they can get some jobs, so they can take care of their families and be an integral part of society. Speaking to your opponent, it's sort of remarkable how consistent he is on his conservative positions. And uh, you, I think, would be characterized as a more liberal candidate. What do you think of the choice that uh, voters face here? It's a pretty stark difference, isn't it? Well, I like to think it's experience versus inexperience. You know, I have the experience. I know what, what's involved with the job. I have the, uh, the history, the life experiences that has taken me to a point where I'm able to do a lot of things, you know, like when I say I grew up in a neighborhood of civil rights leaders, I'm, across, I'm next door to uh, former county commissioner Harold Webb, if th those of you who may know a little bit about that. I grew up across the street from the first black mayor, Clarence Leitner. Uh, John Winters, former Senator John Wilters, built my home. My father was J.D. Lewis. These were leaders in the community. So they taught me how to do things and how to take us through a period of, of unrest like we are having now, even like 
and how to work with people to get some things done. Those are the lessons and the experiences that I bring to the table. So I'd like to say that I have the experience of the past. I have the understanding and knowledge of the present. And I have the vision for the future that we can work together and we can solve some of these problems and we can make North Carolina come out of this COVID uh, pandemic and some of the strife that we're having stronger than before. Thank you very much. I have wow, just one more question for you. You're a uh, Lieutenant Governor's member of the State Board of Education. Um, of course, one of the issues uh, that, that uh, is a consistent tension in this pandemic is, is how and when we bring children back to school. Uh, you know, in, in other states, we are seeing uh, urban and rural districts, uh, districts bringing students back to school um, and, without, and, and, and being able to contain the infection. Uh, what do you think about North Carolina? Do you think we're moving at the right pace? Do you think we're moving too fast or too slow? Well, we all know that this is an unknown for everybody, you know, and there are different people who are trying different things. I think Governor Cooper has done an amazing job in, in, in closing us down and opening us up in phases, trying to keep the numbers and the percentages down to a certain level. And he did that at his own political, uh, he put his politics on the line and came on the side of the people of North Carolina and our safety. Now, as far as our opening up our schools, I think some schools may be able to open up faster than others because of their location, how deep the virus is in that community. And that combined with science and uh, uh, local government making those decisions for their communities, that we can begin to open some things up. But I also know that if things get out of hand again, we need to be able to pull it back. You know, uh, I think that the governor just allowed uh, the other day for some elementary schools uh, students, where elementary schools follow direction a little bit better than our college students do right now. So uh, I can <laughs> see it more beginning on the elementary level. You all know what it was like when you were in college, you felt invincible, you know, so. Uh, uh, I think our elementary kids are a good place to start that with. Von Lewis Holly, thank you so much for, for uh, speaking to us today. I'll let you know what we're doing from here. We're going to start doing our endorsements on October 1st and finish them on October 15th, which is when early voting begins. But we do appreciate you spending some time with us and answering our questions today. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you. I, it's, it's, I thought I was going to get a good grilling. <laughs>